A very good evening to one and all present here. I, Dr. Komal Lalwani, on behalf of Nationwide Quality of Care Network, invite you all to today's community of practice session. This session is a student-led primer on patient safety for healthcare workers. Now, without waiting for further ado, we'll move forward. And I would like to invite Dr. Vikram Datta to invite our speakers for today's session. Dr. Vikram Datta is the Director Professor of Department of Neonatology at ABVIMS in Dr. RNN Hospital in Delhi. He is the current President of Nationwide Quality of Care Network and former Vice President for National Neurology Forum India. He is the guest editor of PMJ Open Quality South Asia Edition. He is the member of editorial group of International Journal for Quality in Healthcare Communications. He is the expert at the International Society for Quality in Healthcare. He is a lead for National Mentoring Group and Technical Resource Group Lead for Sustainable Model for Lakshya by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare India. He is also a member of QED, that is Quality, Equity and Dignity Working Group at the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare India. I welcome you, sir, and request you to please welcome our speakers for today's session. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Komal. Good evening, friends. In fact, it's a wonderful occasion and a very unique uh, occasion today that we are here to talk about patient safety. And talking about patient safety, which has emerged as a main WHO theme and also led to the identification and notification of the World Patient Safety Day. We at NQCN are very serious about the aspects related to patient safety. Friends, all of you know that patient safety and quality go hand in hand. And patient safety issues are normally, usually, and unknowingly often ill-recognized in healthcare delivery systems across low and middle income economies like India. Now, this is the time that we talk about patient safety, not only at the level of senior consultants, senior nursing colleagues, but with a twist to the tail, I would say. As always, NQCN is bringing forward before you a blend of young talent, which is led by most of our colleagues, whom uh, I think the NQCN team needs no introduction. Uh, we have with us Dr. Kushbu Saha, who's one of the founder members of the Be The Change group of NQCN, a young professional network. Uh, she is now, you know, matured into the health system. And I'm very happy to announce here that she would be incoming as child neurology PG first year at University of Southwestern, Southwestern University as Dallas, Texas, uh, USA. And very soon, uh, Kujbu would be leaving for her further studies in the United States of America. Kujbu has completed an MBBS from Lady Harding Metal College. And she's been certified as a basic life support and advanced cardiac support uh, professional. And also certified in Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And she has led one of very successful quality improvement uh, projects on reducing the daily phone usage, which I think got showcased in the Partners Forum where many of you were witness to the talent of this group be the change. So welcome Kushku to this session and look forward to hearing you. Next, uh, we have uh, Nidhi Malan. I think Nidhi Malan also needs no introduction to NQCN teams. Nidhi has uh, been a founder member of the NQCN be the change group when she was a young uh, nursing student at Lady Harding College of Nursing. And now, as you see, uh, she's also matured into the system. And now she is a registered nurse and midwife at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. So it's been a very uh, you know, pleasant journey looking at uh, how Nidhi, Kushbu, they've all matured into the health system. The passion, however, for quality and patient safety still continues unabated. And uh, like I mentioned, she was uh, a BSc nursing student from 2016 to 2020 and has done a stint of MSc nursing. She's completed MSc nursing in obstetrics and gynae nursing uh, from the prestigious All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Bhubaneswar. So welcome uh, Nidhi to the communities of practice. Look forward to hearing you. And then next, we have none other than Vedanshi Verma. Vedanshi has been one of the authors to our undergraduate module, which um, NQCN has developed.
for the World Health Organization. And Vedanshi currently is a third year MBBA student at Lady Harding Medical College, New Delhi. She's been a part of the organizing committee of the Medicus Conventus Annual Undergraduate Academic Conference of the Lady Harding Medical College, which involves medical uh, students from across the country. And she has uh, volunteered and organized multiple MSAI events like Beat the Burnout, Introduction to Clinics, Project Shield, Feel the Deal 2 and a lot of other projects. So we look forward to Vedanshi sharing her insights into patient safety and what does it mean for MBBS students and how they plan to mainstream it into the health systems as they mature into it. I have my friend Ashwin here. Ashwin is a third year MBBS student at Sri Ramachandra Institute of Higher Education at Chennai, Tamil Nadu. He's uh, already completed and is a certified hockey trainer. He's won the title of the Xavier Student Ambassador of the Year and as a part of the National ESA Program 2022, a very prestigious title. And he's a national officer and national board member of AMSA, Medical Students for Choice Unit 2022-2023. So we look forward to hearing Ashwin. And uh, so I also welcome uh, amongst us, Dr. Rajesh Mehta. As all of you know, Dr. Rajesh Mehta has been instrumental in and has been one of the founders of this very vibrant communities of practice and is a senior consultant and was formerly the regional advisor at the World Health Organization, Southeast Asia Regional Office, which is based in New Delhi. And uh, Sir has uh, led the very successful development and implementation of the point of care quality improvement package for global application. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mehta. Your presence means a lot to the young students, I'm sure. And we also have uh, uh, my esteemed governing board members. And we also have Dr. Sonika Agarwal. I think uh, we will be promoting ma'am and taking her into the panelist group. Dr. Sonika Agarwal, as most of you know, is a pediatric neurology consultant at CHOP uh, in the USA. And she has done a single, uh, you know, good evening, ma'am. Uh, very nice to see you here amongst uh, this session and welcome to the communities of practice once again, ma'am. So over to you, Dr. Komal, for taking this session forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Vikram. So now uh, we will move uh, forward with the session on patient safety by the students. And after this, we can have a short Q&A session with them. Hello, everyone. So today we've gathered here to discuss about patient safety, the status quo and the way forward in an LMIC setting. So before we start, NQOCN, the Nationwide Quality of Care Network, Point of Care Quality Improvement India, Community of Practice. This is an inclusive platform that was created to foster collaboration among healthcare workers like you and I, the nursing systems and the medical professionals, just to improve healthcare quality. Members can share innovative ideas, they can gain new practical learnings, and at the end of the day, it can encourage capacity building, mentorship, and creates a pool of QI experts so that we can impact healthcare at the grassroots level, and not just in India, but also in another, other LM, LMIC countries as well. So before we start, we need to realize what exactly is patient safety, even though these two words seem to be pretty um, simple, but what do they actually mean? So the idea of patient safety is based on the idea of the Hippocratic Oath, the oath that we take before we begin the practice of medicine. And that forms the basis of modern medicine. That essentially means do no harm. As defined by WHO, it is a framework of, framework of organized activities that creates cultures, processes, procedures, behaviors, technologies, and environments in a healthcare that consistently and sustainably lowers the risk, reduces the occurrence of avoidable harm, and makes error less likely to reduce the impact of harm when it does occur. So when exactly did we start talking about health safety in healthcare? It goes back to the period of after Second World War, when many countries were developing uh, their healthcare systems. The idea of safety was limited to the traditional hazards at that time, such as fire, equipment failure, patient falls, and risk of infection. There was also this belief, which is an interesting fact to know, that healthcare workers, such as well-trained staffs that are doctors and nurses, 
but always behave carefully and conscientiously to seek to avoid or minimize that were seen as inevitable complications of care. And these complications were simply restricted to mostly wrong blood growth, post-operative bleeding. Such incidents didn't really make the headline because primarily it was seen as inevitable cost of doing business in a pressurized, fast-moving environment of modern healthcare that was saving lives and successfully treating many more diseases. It was only after the 1990s that there was a paradigm shift in the thinking about safety in healthcare practice. And that came with the realization that it was not completely different from other high-risk industries like aviation. And it was understood that human error is a complex amalgam of actions, interactions, processes, and team relationships, communications, technology, and organizational culture that essentially changes the nature of the operating environment. So this change in perception of medical error from being an inevitable isolated event to a system failure happened late in the 21st century, which is a very interesting fact to know that this was the point that led to the recognition of the scale of the problem in healthcare delivery system and led to a global movement of proactively making healthcare safer through emphasis on conditions under which patients succeed rather than fail. So now let's understand what is exactly the magnitude of error. As we see, it was only in 1999 that the magnitude of the problem was realized with the release of the landmark report, which uh, was the, to err his human, building a safer healthcare system published by the United States Institute of Medicine that extrapolated a death rate from the incidence of adverse events in United States hospital to be at least 44,000 to 98,000. So what is the economic cost of unsafe care? And this can only be understood that it occurs in two ways. There's a direct cost that is because of resource wastage and there are indirect costs in, the, in terms of loss of productivity in the population. In high income countries, you'll be surprised to know that there is 15% of hospital expenditure that can be attributed to sheer wastage due to safety failures. For example, the National Health Service in England paid 1.63 billion pounds, which amounts to 1.64 lakh crore in INR just in litigation costs because of safety lapses in the period of 2017 to 2018. So to put everything in picture, unsafe care ranks third in terms of cause of death globally after cardiovascular diseases and cancer contributed, contributing to around 2.6 million deaths annually in the world. Isn't it shocking to know how healthcare industry whose objective was to save lives and improve quality of life is leading to such high morbidity and mortality. And this highlights why patient safety is not only a global agenda, but also a major public health challenge. Right, so I hope till now you got a fair idea about what patient safety is and why is it so important that we're here today to talk about it. Uh, as we move forward, there are multiple components of safety in a healthcare setup. Essentially, two of these components, patient safety and staff safety, are the main factors that uh, contribute to multiple risk factors to the healthcare professionals as well as the patients. So uh, let's talk about sta staff safety. Right. So um, we somehow, someday, probably in our entire entirety of our life, we must be involved in some or the other healthcare setup. By contributing to the healthcare setup in any manner, you would have taken samples, done some procedures, or, uh, or in a non-cooperative patient, or even be a bystander, for example, in a third and fourth professional postings. In this particular setup, you might have observed, and especially if you're a part of the uh, government setup, that uh, the patient versus the manpower and the healthcare staff that is provided to us is pretty disproportionate. And in such conditions, uh, the chances of sharp injuries, the chances of incidents of chemical and drug exposure, the chances of violence and stress is incre increased multifactorially. So, um, Essentially, violence and stress are the two main factors that the media is also talking about these days. And this is the reason why it, uh, the reason why they're talking about this so much is because it's become so prevalent. And literally, um, every every uh, news channel, every um, uh, the, every news channel, every TV channel is covering this. So uh, just 
so just for a fun fact i just want to tell you that health sector bags the hashtag one rank for the most cases of non-fatal work injury and illness how ironic is this right moving forward this webinar was uh, essentially supposed to be about patient safety centric so why am i emphasizing on st staff safety so much it's because the healthcare setup and the patients are sort of metaphorically involved in an ecosystem together the patients cannot function independent of the staff and the staff cannot function independent of the patients so today i'm going to talk about um, how a staff safety is a major issue in patient safety how a staff safety is the major issue in treating patient safety so three of these factors i would like to emphasize on so for example in covid-19 pandemic the staff who was provided with a particular a uh, personal protective equipment held them to prevent the risk of infection not just to themselves but also to the patients coming forward with the uh, addressing the blame culture in the healthcare staff by enabling them to feel more psychologically safe and helping them speak up for the incidents of unsafe care and near misses we are actually increasing their uh, mental health and by increasing their mental health and promoting a better work life culture we are sort of Im improving the uh, way in which they are going to help their patients forward so that is also uh, an entirely issue which i'll be talking about in my subsequent slides and the third thing that i would i would want to specify here is about ensuring the safe staffing levels this is a major issue that i also addressed like uh, two minutes back that in a specifically in a government setup the patient load versus the healthcare staffs the interns the pgs the jrs the srs that are provided to that particular unit is completely disproportionate four people if if there was supposed to be a vacancy for four people to work in one unit literally one or two people are working there so the decline this causes a decline in the motivation of that one person who's been pressurized so much and overburdened and that person essentially faces a burnout so um this sort of decreases the uh, productivity of that particular person as well as hampers the quality of care that would be provided to the patient moving forward I have to address a um, few parameters that will help the healthcare workers to feel, feel safe. These are pretty straightforward. All of us know this, but it is difficult to implement. To establish synergies between the healthcare worker safety and the patient safety policies and strategies. Essentially, the government can help us with formulating better policies and strategies. If, for example, you can see that NHS in the UK has been working on something which is called as um, the uh, it, it's a very very close knit circle where you know the the culture of work life balance is very well established so our government also has uh, something to uh, learn from the other countries as well second point comes out to the uh, to develop and implement national programs for the occupational health and safety of the healthcare workers essentially the same as what i mentioned before protect healthcare workers from violence in the workplace improve the mental health and psychological well-being which i'll be talking about in my subsequent slides protect healthcare workers from physical and biological hazards essentially by personal pro protective equipment as well as um um holding campaigns about making them aware of you know uh, the hazards that they could be suffering from and the um, the reflex time for um, the hazards could be decreased so as to improve the um, care that it could be provided with next slide coming down to the most important aspect of um, my portion that would be the psychological safety now psychological safety essentially is a shared belief that it's okay to speak up and it's okay to take the interpersonal risks now uh, these interpersonal risks may have may take the form of contradicting others asking questions or sharing new or alternative ideas in a complex multidisciplinary environment such as the healthcare system psychological safety enables the effective communication and promotes the safe, delivery of safe and reliable care to the patients now the three key words that are here i want to emphasize on is feeling safe number two approaching someone or having confidence in someone in a conflicting opinion 
on a setup where you feel that the other person might have a different opinion, but still being able to approach them. And number three, having a positive and a healthy outlook towards it in order to completely and solely drive for a safe and reliable uh, and protected environment for patient care is what I'm looking forward to in a psychological safety and healthcare disciplinary. Now, there's a slight difference between having trust in a person and feeling psychological, psychologically safe. Trust is essentially, you'll ask yourself a question, will you give others the benefit of doubt when you take, the, take a particular risk? However, in psychological safety aspect, you will ask the, the question that will others give you the benefit of doubt when you take a risk? So trust is essentially about what you do for the other people, but psychological safety is how you feel with respect to the other people. Moving forward. The four quadrants of psychological safety I want to talk about here are the learner safety, the collab, the collaborator safety, the challenger safety and the inclusion safety. Now, in learner safety, we are trying to empower people to understand what psychological safety essentially is for them to discover, to ask questions, to experiment and look for new opportunities. And so, for example, if a new intern enters in a um, unit, and that person is essentially not equipped to what all is happening in that particular unit, but you let them experiment, you let them discover their own way out, you let them have new opportunities and a positive outlook that's called learner safety. Collaborator safety is to engage in an unconstricted way, interact with colleagues, have a mutual access, maintain open dialogue and foster the um, constructive debate. Now challenger safety. It's basically challenging the status quo, speaking up, expressing ideas, identifying the changes and exposing the problems. This is essentially about the conflicting situations I was referring to. If you have a conflicting situation with a particular colleague and you feel that, you know, I might not be looked in a positive outlook, but you still go forward with it. You express your ideas, you express changes, and you feel that I would have a positive response from them, if not the same response that's called challenger safety and inclusion safety refers to when you know that you're valued when you know that people all people will treat you fairly when you know that you feel ex you feel your experience and ideas matter and that regardless of your title whether you're an intern you're a jr you're a you're a pg you're a sr and you're talking to a consultant or the hod of that particular unit you feel like your points and your ideas would matter that's called inclusion safety so the four quadrants of psychological safety being the learner safety the collaborator safety the challenger safety and the inclusion safety moving forward um this is two different tables i'll be talking about simultaneously first is giving you a particular stimulation and idea about what are the barriers and what are the facilitators in an in an environment that create psychological safety for example we look at the infrastructure part if you're unable to raise the concerns in a private setup because you fear that you know the rigid the rigidity of the people there is such that you will not be able to voice your opinion is a barrier but a facilitator in the same thing would be the the hospital policies the reporting system the private environment over here, the people will have, um, if they have like, you know, a feedback form, for example, if they have like particular concrete policies that give you a right to your personal autonomy and your ideas that would promote a sense of psychological safety. Now, uh, safety in a, a safety culture, negative culture and lack of um, lack of conformity would increase a barrier in psychological safety whereas the safety curriculum and hospital policies and quality improvement as we all know about would increase the and would facilitate a process of psychological safety um the culture the hierarchy system that we continuously face in our everyday life the lack of inclusiveness and the blame culture that i talked about previously are barriers for example if you're told by someone that you know you are a particularly only uh, an MBBS student and you cannot sort of Im improve the system by giving any ideas. That's a sort of barrier here, but a positive outlook and a leader leadership inclusion and uh, enablement of juniors. And you know, the, the symbiotic relationship that we have in a unit that would create a facilitative environment for psychological safety. And there are many more, which include teamwork, ability, motivation, confidence, occupational self, efficacy and the workload workload i've already talked about pretty in pretty detail 
moving on to how to create a sense of psychological safety in a, a code or crisis the reason why we talk about psychological safety is not because of our everyday life but in the, in the case of crisis or a code of in a crisis situation for example a covid-19 pandemic everyone's mental health was at a state of like chaos right so this is where this is the particularly incident where incidents where where we have to strengthen the case of psychological safety and mental health issues to enable and create a sense of psychological safety what we can do is be accessible to people not just just because we belong to um you know uh, uh, we are lower in the hierarchy we're not a consultant yet doesn't mean that we cannot sort of promote the, the area of psychological safety again as mentioned before it's an ecosystem so being accessible asking someone how can i help you what can i do about for you is enabling someone's psychological safety the acknowledge acknowledging the limits of knowledge for example um everyone is not an open book everyone is not a dictionary not everyone would know everything here right so um just mere uh, wording such as the situation is over my head i'll just look this up and get back to you is enabling psychological safety because you do not feel the pressure of knowing everything to invite participation by asking questions just what are we miss are we missing anything does anyone have any other suggestions this sort of entails that you know i am also included how people um, hold people accountable for their um, um, for their transgress transgressions so if i talk about stuff like don't speak to her like that or it's that's not okay making your boundaries very clear by establishing the code of conduct in a particularly professional environment helps you create a sense of psychological safety setting boundaries as i already talked about highlighting the failures as opportunities and using the direct language um and also being willing to display the fallibility of a person if i miss this diagnosis let's reset let's restart this process again so accepting and acknowledging the other person's um mistakes as well as promoting a positive culture from that is what will in uh, what will entail a sense of psychological safety so having discussed at length about patient safety and what are the components of patient safety now the question arises how can we as a medical student as a nursing student as a doctor and a fellow nurse ensure patient safety it starts from being aware about the problem at the first place once we know about the problem only then can we identify it work to solve it in a collaborative manner as healthcare system is not a person's job it is a team effort at the end of the day and then at the end of the day we need a strong leadership because it is not a one day challenge it is something that needs to continue and is a is, is an act of sustainability we need a strong leadership to drive the structural and administrative changes to sustain it within the daily functioning so now let's talk about the steps of raising the awareness about patient safety the first step would obviously be to go to the grassroots of the level which would be to provide information to the grassroots level in the form of medical students so when they are a medical or a nursing student it has to be inculcated in them during their formative years in the words of james clear author of the book atomic habits success is the product of daily habits not in not once in a lifetime transformations and introducing patient safety during the formative years of medical education will ensure it becoming a habit among healthcare workers of the future patient safety and quality improvement courses are not formally included in the undergraduate medical education currently in india and the awareness seems to be lacking during the clinical postings which we undergraduate students currently go through and currently there is no explicit framework that has been identified for the curriculum however organizations like nqocn have started work on the same and will be rolling out its workshops on patient safety primer for healthcare professionals this year similarly a point of care quality improvement module exclusively for mbbs students will also be rolled out this year now talking about the who curriculum guide it's a very important guide which is already existing in the curriculum known as who patient safety curriculum guide for medical students which provides a comprehensive framework for teaching patient safety and minimizing medical errors so let me talk about this particular curriculum it explains that it provides recommendations on the teaching methods the use of real life simulation projects to make help students uh, better understand how to patient how patient safety principles are applied in the real world and give them the practical experience in implementing them 
it does acknowledge the challenge and the difficulty in creating a new curriculum which is already a busy one a very hectic one hence it does suggest integrating patient safety education which pro provides a various topics like displayed in the particular slide its complexity the role of teamwork and many more into the existing curriculum rather than creating a new block or a new schedule of time so to, to substantiate how effective such an integration can be i studied a a study which was done by kutami which used an example of retained sponge in a cadaver in first year medical students dissection hall sessions which was used to explain the concept of patient safety among the medical students so what they were basically asked to do was to identify what are the foreign objects inside this cadaver which might be present in an actual surgical setup so this session features interactive exercises toxin quality improvement science safety tools and patient experiences tests taken before and after sessions re reveal that increased safety knowledge and attitudes pointing to the possibility of including safety education in the basic sciences courses now to conclude i would like to share a personal experience which occurred during my clinical postings a fellow student and i were taking a history of a patient in the medicine ward who had some severe skin infections all over his arms and all the beds of the ward were occupied and the student nurses had to take the vitals including blood pressure etc of the patients so after taking the particular uh patient's uh, blood pressure this particular student nurse hurriedly moved to the next patient without disinfecting the bp cuff and we noticed the issue that there was an infection in the patient's skin which could have been transferred to this bp cuff and could spread various infection to the other already admitted patients so we immediately approached the student nurse and informed her about this issue and potential spread of this infection to other patients through this time we we were able to understand and she was also able to understand the prevalence of such instances on a daily and maybe hourly basis in such wards hence that was when i understood the importance of us the medical and the nursing students being aware of the patient safety incidents its types and how to measure them intervening and improving them at a situation in the hospital setup and not just the consultants or the senior residents even us medical students be it second year or third years can definitely intervene and point out these uh, problems as we also gather a perspective coming for our daily clinical postings as the future generation of practitioners we must work towards the improving of quality of care and its safety in existing healthcare setups okay so we discuss about the awareness like awareness about patient safety is important but to bring this patient safety concept into reality we need to collaborate collaborate with everyone on the health team everybody on board so uh, but like as you know that you we all might have played the game of hide and seek in our like childhood uh, one person used everybody used to hide and the and one single person used to find everyone else those who were hiding same is the case with patient safety consider the healthcare team as a person who is supposed to find the hidden errors okay so the possible harming agents what i mean to say is that the possible harming agents are always present in the hospital setting the only point is the only point that makes a difference is how quick we are as a team as an individual to see and identify those hidden harms as healthcare workers alone we can identify and overcome possible safety issues but a possible but a, you know a little extra help and collaboration can hasten to find the factors that harm patient safety let's see how see the health system is no longer about a patient a nurse and a doctor we know that the health system has you know become more complex more diverse we have a uh, physiotherapist we have dietitian we have pharmacist we have now we are also including uh, you know the patient relatives into the like the whole care care function and then also the complexity has increased in terms of the devices medical devices that are available and are around the patient okay so our role usually the thing is mostly we will see in a, a setting that nurses are the connecting link between all these team members collaboration between the team members is a must to avoid repetition and omission of care okay then proper communication is the key 
whatever team members we have, like uh, say in our ward, we have nurses, we have sanitary attendants, we have health attendants, then we have the doctors themselves. So all these people have to communicate among themselves. I'll share an example with you. Like in our, in the setting where I work, there is uh, like sometimes in few patients, those who have, those who are on pain man management regim regimes, so anesthesia, people from anesthesia department will come and give certain medications top up so that uh, they don't feel the pain. Basically, the point is that uh, the person is coming from the another department, but this fact has to be communicated between the all the other members, like the surgeon needs to know who is in charge of that particular case. The nurse needs to know because say somebody got morphine uh, as a pain medication. The, uh, we might be knowing that morphine also tends to result sometimes in bradycardia. So maybe the patient went, under, uh, went uh, into bradycardia and if, say, the nurse who is observing the vital signs is not aware that anesthesiologist has, has come and given the top up, that is why maybe it has happened due to morphine because there are various differentials for a particular situation. So if the uh, anesthesiologist has communicated that yes, I gave the medication. Maybe it, uh, maybe overdose happened or maybe something. So antidote can be given at time instead of wasting time in uh, finding out the exact cause. So communication is the key. We need to communicate with each other to avoid repetition of care, to avoid omission of care. And the point is, the reality is the patient safety concept is quite you know new and. Uh, like new in the sense that it has come into guidelines and all in a very like late uh, in past few years only. So it started from the above. Okay, it started from the top administration. Okay, we should focus on patient safety. But this thing has to percolate to the lower levels. It has to reach the people who are actually working around the patient. And that includes even the sanitary attendants. That, that includes even the patient relatives. Okay, so that they know what is good, what is bad, and how uh, and how like possibly a patient can be harmed. Everyone on the team must be communicated, must be made aware of the patient safety essentials. So you might have seen this meme over the internet. You can see we have a happy patient and then we have there are two people pointing a gun out gun on him but we as a healthcare team we need to be faster because the thing is that uh we have to be you know because patient safety is not about just guidelines and sops it's about more of a more of about common sense okay it's about your proactive thinking your problem solving uh, approach okay you have to anticipate the probable risk and take action accordingly like for example we all have planned to go sometimes we think that we all friends will go to goa when we plan a trip what we think okay we are supposed we are going to goa the temperature will be it will be summer so we need to carry some like uh, a water bottle with us because which we can refill again and again we should carry our umbrellas with us we should carry uh, proper dresses that can that is suitable according to the weather so we plan all these things similarly when we see a patient we should observe the patient and we should plan like see if it's an old patient it's the patient cannot move around so we have to make sure uh, that uh, we have to make sure that the patient uh, like uh, if he cannot move around so we know that yes uh, there is a probable risk of pressure injury so what we can do to prevent that Pre prevent the uh, development of pressure injury. We can have air mattresses. We can have. Uh, we can change the position regularly. So all these things have to be anticipated at um, like beforehand, not after it has happened. So that is about common sense and being, you know, and uh, being one step ahead than the actual risk. Now coming to the major error that happens in the setting: medication error. So medication error like tops our list of patient safety issues. We will discuss from now, like uh, in the next slides, we'll discuss the newer technologies that can be used to tackle this problem. But before that, let's understand why that happens. Okay, so coming to the Swiss cheese model. This model was given by Jane's reason. And to this model helps to explain the occurrence of system failures. And if you will see this metaphor, this is like explaining the complex systems, like the complex working system in which we have barriers that protects that protects a particular uh, individual from harms. So these 
cheese slices that you are seeing these are the barriers and each barrier has certain unintended holes or you can say weaknesses through which you know which result in certain harms but these uh, in but these holes that you are seeing these are the latent errors the active error will happen only when the holes will align as you can see here in uh, these uh, these holes have aligned and the and it has resulted in one active error sometimes at random these holes may not align these weaknesses may not align and that will result in near miss okay the point being that the uh, the point being that the occurrence of errors is at random okay and active errors will happen only and only when the latent errors will uh, align so coming to the medication error specific to the medication error we will see a flow chart so first of all what is medication error medication error is any preventable event that can that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm while the medication is controlled by the healthcare professional patient or consumer like depends whether the patient is self administering or whether it is being given by the health professionals so it can vary so it can occur at any stage of the medication process like during the prescription stage when the doctor is prescribing the medication during the verification phase when the pharmacist is verifying and during the preparation phase preparation like in the sense the actual medication like the pharmacist sometimes they tend to prepare the medication and then send it or sometimes when the preparation is done by the nurse herself and the administration phase which is usually done by the nurses and sometimes high risk medications which are given by the doctors themselves so the point being that uh, first of all the pharmacists have drawn pharmacists in the dotted line because in our setting pharmacists may or may not be prescription is written by the doctor and the nurses they so, uh, like they prepare the medication and they administer the medication so uh, the the thing is that the medication error which is happening here is itself an active error active in the sense that something we have noticed that yes this is this error has happened and who uh, the person usually responsible for the active error is usually usually the nurse the nurse okay so we reprimand or you can say punish the person who does who does that active error but what we forget in all these things is that what actually caused those errors the latent errors which lined up together remember the swiss cheese model okay the latent errors the loopholes the holes that at random aligned in such a way that the active error happened so when it comes to latent errors what what do we have if you will see in the uh, cloud we have the illegible handwriting we don't understand the handwriting maybe the person has written in a very bad handwriting we don't understand what is the medication itself what is the drug like do, uh, dose okay then too many medications there may be multiple medications going on sometimes a patient is on, on a number of uh, pain medications okay like how are they actually needed or uh, can they be exchanged and given at different times okay or can they be reduced or wrong dose in case like say we can only give 4 gram of dose 4 gram of pcm in 24 hours are we exceeding for example are we exceeding that are we exceeding that dose in 24 hours wrong route like few medication are supposed to be given uh, like say deep im povron diclofenac that is given deep im are we giving it in the im route or are we just giving it in a uh, in a at a wrong route somebody a novice or maybe say someone who doesn't know and sub giving it in a uh, maybe subcutaneous you never know so look alike and sound alike drugs this is a uh, like lasa drugs we ca we call them lasa drugs so few drugs like cefiroxim cefoperazon like uh, they are similar sounding and they if i if they would have been gone to your uh, clinical setting they even look alike they all have red caps and they all have red labels so if you see them from a distance they will look alike they even have similar names so that kind of things can also result in error you end up picking up the wrong vial any kind of policy change that happened but but not carried out uh, means the the staff maybe they are not updated and any kind of incompetency maybe the staff who is administering the medication is not competent maybe the person who is prescribing the medication is not competent so all those latent errors are like should be kept in mind because they are the ones which we have to work upon because preventing latent errors can will automatically prevent the active error 
So finding latent errors, how can technology help us? Collaboration is a thing. Humans, humans will help. Uh, like humans are okay, but the thing is, humans are tend you tend to they tend to make mistakes, and technology is something that can help us, uh, like uh, a lot when it comes to preventing errors, when it comes to you know stopping things that can uh, you know result uh, like frequently if not taken care of. So you can see on the left uh, left side of the screen, we have a handwritten note. In the last, if you will try to decipher whatever this uh, picture in this picture, what the person has written in the last year, uh, I think the only thing I'm able to understand is digoxin. I have no idea what are the doses there written one, one to five something and the frequency. So how can we go from this to the picture on the right? You can see clearly the drugs are written, the route plus the frequency, the dose. Everything is written in a very clear computerized manner. So how do we go from left to right? We There is a uh, software we call CPOE, uh, which I have not seen in India. This is an example I picked from abroad. So computerized provider order entry uh, or integrated with CDS, uh, Clinical Decision Support System, CDSS also it's called. So this is a software, it's an electronic application physician they use to order drugs, lab tests and consultation requests. Now say, uh, and now say for example, uh, a person is post-operative and uh, so post-operative prophylaxis of antibiotic is given, uh, you might have studied about it. So the thing is that these antibiotics are like given uh, in a particular doses and at particular times, say ciproxifloxacin 200 mg, six hours after surgery. So that's a like prescri that's a standard thing. It has to be given six hours after surgery. If it has to be given, it's a single dose, depending on case to case variations are there. So this software, what it will do, it will have this whole uh, prescription injection, Ziploc, 200 NG, IV, six hours after surgery, a, a pre-written, all a pre-written prescription. All the person has to do is take it check market okay that's all so there is no problem of uh, bad handwriting no problem of wrong doses no problem of the frequency and you can see it also provides reminders like for most uh, reminders are set like any kind of this is a cds system clinical decision support like whatever you have prescribed is it according to is it clinically right is it clinically sound so they will even give you reminders if in case there is something wrong or something that a usual practice is that that reminders are given. And these are the order sentences like it's already written the drug name, the dose, the route. OK, and how many doses and after how much time that's written. So these are the order sentences. So CDS encom encompasses a wide range of computerized tools. OK, it will help to improve patient care and include computerized reminders advice regarding drug selection. So what are the benefits? Benefit is one thing is direct entry into electronic medical records. Okay, so uh, you might have heard about uh, like in AIMS, uh, we have the ABHA IDs coming up. So all the medical records will go into the using the ABHA ID. Everybody will have one single, uh, everyone, every individual have, will have one ABHA ID, one unique ABHA ID on which they can access their medical records if, of course, they are digitalized. It reduces delays and errors due to handwritten prescription. No time to waste in what the person has written to decipher, to ask other people what is written. So time, no time wastage and proper accuracy, surety, what the person has actually prescribed. It's faster, obviously, and most accurate. OK, now, since you are already meeting the five rights, right medication, right patient, right dose, right time, right frequency, all these five rights are automatically met. and less handling of the prescription. Next, please. Next, uh, this was the CPOE and CDS. After that, we have the medication reconciliation. This is another method, another method of reducing medication error. Now, one thing is that uh, I before reading this, even I don't I didn't realize that we have been practicing this uh, like uh, like we didn't know we are actually doing this, but we are doing this in ward in our ward. Like, first of all, medication reconciliation is a formal process of creating the most, like, you know, complete and accurate list of possible patients. Like, whatever, say there are three shifts. I'm talking about nurses. Okay, there are three shifts. Say I've come in the evening shift, and in the evening shift, there are different medications I'm supposed to give to the patient. Right. So, what we do is we make a list of all the, we will make, open the main register of the treatment book 
okay and we will make a list like what medications am i supposed to give at this particular time during my shift of every patient we make a list so first of all we will verify we will verify we will collect a current medication list okay first is that then we clarify we make sure that the medication doses are appropriate again we'll match the doses with the list because sometimes most of the times we end up giving we have to give one gram pcm one gram pcm is the standard dose IV. but in few cases we give 500 mg depending on the patient condition if there is any kidney or liver dysfunction so depend or the weight itself is less of the patient so 500 mg so we have to see whether the doses are according or not then we reconcile we compare new medication in case so any kind of medication update has been done before that medication list has been made so we match if there has been any addition or any deletion del sorry any medication has been deleted so we change those medication we reconcile okay and then we transmit what we transmit we give the medication to the we give the list to the nurse who is supposed to actually administer the medication so verify clarify reconcile transmit that is medication reconciliation coming to the last is the medication error encouragement training this is my favorite favorite in the sense that this is something we can have for the students for the undergrads or even postgrads we all have uh, like we have OSCE examinations where we have terminal stations where st various stations right so we can have an OSCE uh, with this basic idea that this thing is the meat is about uh, you know error training it's like an error the may, may, uh, name itself is saying error encouragement training so what it does it encourages the student to do error but but in a controlled situation you have a controlled situation and the person who has set the environment like the teacher herself she uh, deliberately will put her and there some errors like uh, she will say that this is the patient uh, so, uh you have uh, you are supposed to administer say a tab augment to patient a at so and so time so they are deliberately changing the patient so the student has to verify every step they have to make sure they have the right patient they have the right medication they have the right dose so everything they have to like you know confirm before giving so that is a Control setting. One is an error encouragement training. Then one is error, error avoidance training. What we have till date is error avoidance only. We teach the students to avoid the error. That's good. But the thing is, in real life scenario, you might try to avoid error, but errors will happen. Okay. Then what? Then what will you do? The thing is, then you will be like, uh, you will try to suppress the error. That will be your first instinct. Ki khud ko bachao. We did an error. Let's save ourselves. But that will not prevent the harm. That will prevent harm to you only. But what about the patient? So then the third part is error guidance training. Error guidance is like in case error ho bhi gaya, error happened, then what? Then what you are supposed to do? If you have given double dose to someone, then what you are supposed to do? Notify. And then what? Like error guidance is this only. Like you basically make the student understand that if the error happens what to do next not to go and hide and hide the error but to tell the error so that it can be handled well so error guidance training should also be given to the student so this was about medication error encouragement training coming to the last uh, coming to the uh, like conclusion take the take home messages first of all expecting perfection from health professional only creates chances of more error see we are humans okay humans are bound to make mistakes accepting this limitation is our superpower except we'll make mistakes okay so how to not make mistake not don't expect to that humans will be perfect we will ask them to be uh, you know like double check everything because that's not possible it's cumbersome humans get bored okay so Placing them in a second point itself is the solution. Putting staff and patient in an error-proof workplace is the key. You put them in a situation, you put them in an environment which is less error-proof. You uh, separate your lookalike sound or like drugs so that you don't pick wrong medication. Okay, you uh, like you can have a certain like cross-checking system. You can have the medical reconciliation reconciliation system in your wards. So that's the point. 
then uh, third is never expect the chances of patient harm to be zero it will never ever reduce to zero it even if it's 0.1% 1% 10% it will always be there you will always have a risk of harming your patient not you maybe the patient himself will harm herself by mistake unknowingly i'll share an example with you okay so uh, i once got the post op cubicle to uh, you know under my care turns out uh, see whenever uh, you uh, you might have studied whenever we remove a foley's catheter of a patient we make sure that they pass urine within few hours because there is a chance of uh, you know urine retention so avoid that so one of my patient that foley catheter, catheter was removed so i had to make sure that in my 7 6 hour shift that i i had to make sure that she had uh, like she passes urine uh, which is uh, like uh, you know something a big thing for me like because i have to make sure the patient has to pass, pass urine and turns out this patient was uh, bedridden okay she uh, she's old she's fragile bedridden cannot move around and uh, so her attendant obviously her attendant has to help her with the same thing so uh, i was checking like it, i was asking her frequently did you pass urine did you pass urine she didn't she said no i don't want to pass i am not feeling the urge to pass urine okay i was fine okay fine she's not feeling the urge to pass urine and the whole shift she didn't uh, like the my shift ended and during my shift i also did her bed sore dressing so uh, while the shift was ending while i was giving the handover of my patient to the next shift person uh, just by chance like her dressing was supposed to be done so the doctor removed her uh, blanket and she had passed urine on the bed herself like she was soaked in her urine and this was something i was not expecting in my wildest dream that the patient will pass urine on the bed so that day i realized no matter how hard i try to make sure everything goes right something will go wrong and this is since then i have made sure that i'll i'll in my every shift i'll make sure that yes i'll just check whether uh, the person is not soaking under the blanket because the blanket which is supposed to keep the patient warm that blanket is hiding the actual reason of the patient getting wet so there will be the chances will never be zero accept it learn everything daily okay so that is the thing next is the elevate the voices of patient patient is something someone that is the center of our whole healthcare system okay the patient can tell you a lot if you just hear them out okay just hear them out whatever they have to say they can tell you how the problem like how they uh, the harms can be prevented okay elevate their voices and as you know this is the theme of uh, the patient safety day 2023 so patient uh, collaborating with patient is the most foolproof collaboration we can have to prevent the errors so by now you must have learned we've learned so many components about patient safety about how to implement them and how to ensure that safety is ensured but how to successfully implement them requires a strong leadership and to practically and sustain them over time we need a system change it cannot be done by individuals like you and i it needs a leadership that sustains it over time so in the broader framework of universal health care coverage which you might be all knowing about improving the quality of healthcare in india has received more focus in the recent years there's a paradigm shift in thinking about provision of universal healthcare and now there's a shift towards providing quality healthcare to patients who are receiving who are at the receiving end it started in 2015 when the 68th who regional patient safety strategy for the southeast asia including india with the agenda to support development of national quality care which was a patient and patient safety strategies in 2016 we finally had a framework a national framework for coordinated implementation of patient safety activities which led to the genesis of the national patient safety implementation framework so what it does basically is it serves a guideline it serves a national guideline so that we can coordinate the fragmented patient safety initiatives that have been taken that have been there in place that have have been there in places in healthcare systems and ensure that they are connect, conducted in a more sustained uniform manner across all levels of healthcare now the agenda of this today's meeting was to understand how patient safety which is a theoretical concept and how can we implement that in a country as diverse as india one of the biggest democracy of the world and with the biggest population in the world by now 
how do we ensure quality in such a vast country like india this is it is a huge challenge because there's huge variation in terms of population in terms of literacy socio economic status and many other health determinants so the ministry of family welfare implemented this multi pronged approach that you can see on the screen to improve the knowledge and skills of healthcare workers along with periodic evaluation and monitoring to ensure that delivery of effective healthcare is done and equitable and patient centered care is provided to the patients receiving healthcare you can see this consists of a rapid approach which was to create a culture of quality instead of forcing it upon the doctors and the healthcare workers it was to create a cultural change focusing on the key areas such as cleanliness infection prevention and this was done under the kaya kalp mission which you might be knowing about respectful maternity care around birth which is which comes under the laksha mission and breastfeeding practices now the second approach is centered around building uh and supporting this quality safety by horizontal integration of all the public health functions hospital functions quality and patient safety requirements under the uniform standards and measurement system which is known as the NQ NQAS this was in turn done to contribute to achieving a larger goal at the end of the day and that is to ensure universal health coverage and in, at the end of the day achieve a sustainable development goals now you might be wondering these are all system changes which are happening but this cannot be done alone at the level of the government as per the ppp which is a public private partnership we have another key player in developing and sustaining a systems change and as you all know the host of this webinar and the one that brought us all together the leading name in the world of qi the one which led to the creation of this platform so that we could talk about all these issues and grow together nqcn the nationwide quality of care network point of care quality improvement india community of practice so as you can see this is a page that uh, tells us the purpose of this uh, community of practice finishing it with the global patient safety action plan as you can see this was developed by who and it aims to eliminate avoidable harms in healthcare from the period 2021 to 2030 the key points are we have to improve leadership governance and culture of patient safety by strengthening the existing systems and policies and promoting a culture of care the second point was to empower the patient as we all know and as nidhi has discussed the theme for today's uh, for this year's uh, patient safety day is elevate the voice of patients we have to empower the patients because they are the center of our healthcare provision system we have to improve them by engaging them and their families and supporting the healthcare workers together and lastly we have we cannot depend on just human resources we have to implement solutions for safety such as medication practices create a workforce centered and integrate a people centered approach through innovation research and partnership so yes patient safety is not just in theory but it is something that we can implement even in a settings uh, of india which is an lmic setting where resources might not be at its best but still we can create a culture of change and we can sustain it so as you can see safety is not just a gadget but it's a state of mind thank you thank you so much uh, dear friends i think we've had a phenomenal uh, discussion today and uh, before i open uh, it for a round of discussion we've got two experts i'll also be calling upon dr sonika agarwal for her observations on uh, the student led primer on patient safety and but first i have the privilege of inviting uh, dr rajesh mehta for his quick comments over to you dr rajesh mehta sir for your quick comments okay so till uh, we have dr rajesh mehta coming in over, uh, over to you dr sonika agarwal ma'am okay um so firstly i'll congratulate um, all four of you khushbu nidhi doctors khushbu nidhi vedanshi and ashwin this was uh, really as dr datta said it was a phenomenal presentation and so when i see it was i was very happy to see so much enthusiasm in the medical student level about how to change the patient safety and the work culture and the environment for uh, the benefit of both the healthcare workers and the uh, patient community so um i know in your presentations you touched upon uh, you know india is the largest user of mobile and uh, broadband and technology so um and patient safety has been shown to change you know with the order sets with pathways 
with standardized treatment. So do you see it being more and more used in the uh, hospitals that have the infrastructure to implement that? And um, the other thing I had a question also, um, you talked about the psychological safety and the work environment, how to address those issues. And I know I've been reading in the news some uh, recent uh, issues with all the burnout in the COVID years. Uh, and it's worldwide problem. It's not in India. It's it's the whole um, healthcare system around the world. So is there uh, special initiatives from hospitals to address that or toolkits that are being developed for having something, you know, like a flow chart or something at the bedside or in the work areas that someone can refer to as a pathway to address any issues that happen? That's a very well um, hot question uh, by Dr. Sonika Agarwal. And I would like to take the chance to answer the question. So first of all, uh, you asked about incorporation of technology in delivery of patient care, which makes patient, uh, which makes healthcare uh, more safe. So I would like to share an example. I was currently working as a junior resident at Institute of Human Behavior and Health Sciences. Um, and so we cater to a population of around 2,000 to 3,000 patients in a single day at the level of OPD, which is a huge population of patients to be uh, tackled by mere 16 uh, physicians. And in that case, uh, I noticed that when we're following up on patients with headache, and especially when we're treating headache and epilepsy, there's a lot of emphasis that is put on uh, knowing when the last event happened. We need the patient to be empowered so that they know when the event happened, what was the event about, whether it be it headache or an epilepsy or a seizure attack. We need them to document all those events so that we can monitor and we can change the medications accordingly. And uh, there was a, this was this was a simple uh, uh, like a, like something that I uh, asked the patient to do. We even in, and there was no app that was used for it. Everybody is using WhatsApp on the uh, phones. So if you use the WhatsApp feature, there is a feature to pin your uh, chat on the uh, on the starting, and you can pin that chat, which is just like a note diary. Whenever you're using WhatsApp, everybody's using WhatsApp on a daily basis. So ask the patients that if you can't write it on your uh, if you can't write it on the paper, you can just hold the record button. Just say what you want, what you felt like, how the how severe the headache was, where the headache was located, and how many hours did it last, and whether whether did you have to take a rescue medication or not, and just record those uh, events. And by the time we came to follow up visits, we had those series of voice recordings, and just by the series of voice recordings, huh, the voice recording, able to understand how the uh, medication was benefiting the patient or not. So I feel like these are these simple interventions which can be made and simple apps that can be developed just to empower the patient so that they are more in charge of their own healthcare and of their own uh, self. And to answer your second question, which was about uh, incorporation of SOPs to promote a psychological, psychologically safer environment, in the same institute, we have these uh, big uh, charts which are placed in every ward on how to tackle aggressive patients. So this is a format of SOP which has been used and which is a very standard protocol on how to tackle an aggressive patient, which means to uh, keep a distance from them. You should not be using a very high uh, raised volume while addressing those patients and not to, be, not to showcase uh, hand movements and eye movements, which might make the patient more aggressive and it becomes very important in a case in a hospital which is catering to patients with psychiatric and neurological diseases so i feel like sops like that which have been in place and i feel more sops in trying to deal with interpersonal problems uh, relating to doctors and physicians especially at least in the doctor staff room where all the doctors are gathered so that we are at least talking about this issue and as we mentioned like once we start talking about it, only then we'll be able to identify the lapses in care and, and then improve them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank Kushbu. You. I think uh, Dr. Sonika, she has uh, shared her experience with the limitations of the LMIC setting. And now I'm sure we would like to catch up with her when she does her residency in the US and uh, has a different perspective on the other side of the world. So over to, uh, I would be now next posing a question to Nidhi Malan. Uh, Nidhi, you are working in All India Institute of Medical Sciences now as a, a staff nurse, and you've previously worked in uh, Ames Bhavneshwar as well, two of the most prestigious institutions, and prior to that in Lady Harding Medical College during the yes. course of your training. 
There's a question from Ambe Sirvastav. He wants to ask how much is it possible or feasible to improve patient safety in case of public health facilities which are overburdened most of the time. As you know, I think AIMS is also pretty overburdened these days. And most of the time, quality is highly compromised. Do you agree to that? Because doctors also have to deliver service to each patient. I would also like you to give a perspective on the nurses because I believe that the patient safety is much more paramount, uh, you know, responsibility. And I would say the part of patient safety, I would personally write from our personal experience and also professional experience being in the NICU. I feel that my nursing team uh, is one of the backbones of patient safety and quality. So your perspective, do you agree to the statement that doctors are overburdened and, and that is why quality is compromised and we have to deliver service to each patient and how we can improve patient safety? You just shared an example, something else to add? Uh, yes, sir. Actually, uh, uh, the thing is that it's a vicious cycle, to be honest, because see, there are so many patients we have, we are supposed to deal with uh, so many patients and we are less, like they are outnumbered and like uh, multiple times. But the thing is, this uh, this difference in number uh, tires us. It also uh, results in decrease in that psychological safety. The staff safety is also, you know, compromised. So we are also at the low end. The patient itself are the at, are at the receiving end. But then again, this problem will exist considering the pol uh, that population of our country. But we somehow like tend uh, to face that like we have the medication reconciliation we practice it we practice that to avoid medication error we make a very uh, nice consolidated list in every shift so that we know that every patient gets the right drug and the right dose we don't play with drugs we are very cautious about it and we also have like as i said uh, in our setting we have the look alike and sound alike drugs separated we are very conscious about it to prevent medication errors. So we just practice. As I said, that during my presentation, we were not, I was not aware of this medication reconciliation, but we were practicing it as a common sense thing. It turns out we have been doing things in the right way, but we just didn't know the right term. So I think AIMS is handling well. Okay, so uh, you have the whole country to uh, give this message to. So I'm sure that your example would go along well with other nursing colleagues as well as young professionals who are here. We have a lot of questions coming up. We have a question from Dr. Kirti Nirmal, who is microbiology faculty at US University College of Medical Sciences and GTB Hospital, New Delhi. Yeah, Dr. Kirti wanted to ask, are you involving data of needle stick injuries in patient safety along with drug side effects? So I would request uh, Dr. Sushil Sirvastav, I think he's a professor of uh, pediatrics and looking after the neonatal ICU at uh, University College of Medical Sciences. Sushil, are you there if you'd like to take this question? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, thanks, Vikram. And uh, first of all, I must congratulate our young Tuts. Excellent presentation and uh, really proud of you all, guys. And regarding question by Dr. Kirti, yeah, in our... Uh, your uh, quality assurance and quality uh, kayakal, uh, uh, your program in our hospital, we are keeping a detailed account of all needistic injuries uh, which happen in our hospital, along with your uh, closure of these incidents or near miss events. Regarding uh, your uh, uh, follow up of, uh, I think th that was the one question and I think she asked, uh, there was one more question, yeah, let me check. Uh, uh, yeah, regarding drug side effects, well, drug side effects, uh, Precisely, as per our Lakshya and Kayakalp, your uh, uh, protocol or SOPs, uh, they do not have this monitoring parameter. But uh, individual, ward-wise, especially in, in terms of pediatrics, which I can say that we do have a weekly resolution of any drug side effects, especially with regards to immunization. Immunization, we follow a very strict protocol of uh, noting even minor to uh, any uh, adverse event or any event during uh, or uh, uh, immediately after immunization. So yes, for immunization, we have a very strict policy, but when it comes to medication and the adverse side effects, we do not have a proper documented protocol of noting or, or observing or, or documenting. And as, uh, as I told you, in even for, in my knowledge, as per our uh, uh, NQA standards, as well as CHI-CUP standards, these are not documented on a routine basis. Having said that, uh, I would just like to take uh, Dr. Sonika's uh, question regarding integration of 
technology in uh, patient safety uh, in public sector for for that matter in some of the bigger institutions it is happening uh, other uh, other institutions are yet to adopt and regarding covid burnout uh, that's a good idea in insight yes we have not specifically looked at into uh, resolution of covid burned out and 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 make creating awareness but we did work at nqc and as vikram would remember uh, uh, regarding psychosocial and psychological safety especially among teams in intensive areas and covid pandemic areas and we we had a very resounding uh, feedback as well as a, as i think a paper is also online so with that uh, thank you vikram for giving an opportunity and 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 really loved it very good presentation Thank you so much, Sushil. I think uh, uh, there's a national pharmacovigilance uh, program which is normally run in the medical schools by the Department of Pharmacology, like at Lady Harding Medical College, where I was previously working. I of the Department of Pharmacology were looking after this, and uh, I think most of the other uh, private hospitals also are in tie up with the national pharmacovigilance reporting system of Government of India. So that is something I would suggest for students to report. Yeah, I, and I'll just like, yeah, I'll just like to add that the students have raised very valid points. And it's high time now that in our country, especially, we have a collaborative approach. Yes, safety and pay, whether it's patient safety or healthcare safety, health worker safety for that matter, it's a collaborative. We all have to work mm -hmm. as a collaborative. Uh, and, and, and we can't say that our system is foolproof. No, absolutely not. Even my friends from West or, or European countries would agree to that. So uh, I think it's just a matter of we, we, may, we may not be knowing what, what's happening. So uh, let, let us take the, that first step of awareness and collaborative, increasing patients' voice, uh, customers' uh, feedback. Yes, very, very important. Thank you, Vikram. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Sushil. So I think we have the youngest member here. We, I'd like to call upon Vedanshi Verma, our um, undergraduate student. Uh, Vedanshi, if you are around, do you please join? Is Vedanshi Komal? Is Vedanshi around? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Could we have Vedanshi around? Yeah, so I would just like to pose a question by the time Vedanshi is coming um, online. I would just like to ask a question to Vedanshi and also um, to our uh, other panelists. And the question states as you know that we are talking a lot about patient satisfaction scoring, and I think it's a very pertinent question from one of our governing board members, Dr. Prabha. Dr. Prabha wants to know that, uh, do you guys think as uh, young medical and nursing students that it is time that we also start a survey for uh, mapping the employee satisfaction or the uh, staff safety and the psychological safety? I remember doing a psychological safety 10 question uh, questionnaire in RML hospital recently. And we drew, drew up the mission statement of our NICU. And uh, I think that was the first attempt I tried to look at psychological safety objectively in my unit, the nursing colleagues. So over to you, Vedanshi. What do you think uh, about, uh, you know, uh, taking feedback from the healthcare uh, professionals, especially young medical students regarding their own psychological safety, the, their own perspective towards patient safety and other aspects of uh, uh, medication safety, diagnostic errors, etc. What sort of uh, curriculum uh, have you encountered so far related to these topics in your undergrad medical education? Um, so it essentially, I feel that uh, since the NMC uh, schedule has come up and uh, CBME curriculum has um, sort of uh, restructured our curriculum, uh, at this point, psychological safety is still not included uh, as a core competency uh, in our um, in our schedule, as well as our um, postings, as well as our um, you know lectures. So that is a big flaw, I would say. Um, this topic of mental health and psychological safety is not at all handled, uh, you know, with precision. So uh, that is one thing we all feel that, you know, is not um, covered at all. However, I feel that professors uh, as well as um, seniors and uh, JRs, PGs, they are taking like very, very um, good care as well as, you know, uh, there are groups like Mentor Menti and mentorship programs, which cater to uh, if you're feeling anything and you want to talk about it. So uh, they are incorporating you to have weekly sessions and uh, they are uh, most welcome. You, they make you feel very comfortable and at home. So I feel that that is a very good addition. 
and that is also part of the curriculum but i feel the curriculum needs to be a little more strengthened as to uh, incorporating psychological safety and the entire dynamic of it thank you so much vedanshi for your insights we look forward to this uh, exciting journey now coming uh, to our uh, one of the more uh, younger uh, colleagues ashwin ashwin is great senior journey from attending the point of care quality improvement course to being a part of the communities of practice platform now what do you think uh, what sort of awareness do you see informally if i ask you this question amongst your uh, you know undergrad medical students and your friends and like in hostel what sort of discussions go around patient safety have you ever been party to any discussions like you gave an example about the patient who was measuring the uh, the uh, you know the bp cuff which had a potential to infect the patients so something like this some other discussions and how proactive are the students down south uh, to aspects of uh, patient safety and how do you think you can raise the awareness of medical students across india to various aspects of patient safety and so that it's hardwired as you enter the health system into more senior roles oh yes so that's a very relevant question so around um, my experience in the past two years of our clinical posting um, i think so many medical students going to different departments every single day provides a fresh perspective that maybe doctors and nurses are not able to identify with some of sometimes we medical students are able to identify as, as a third person so i'm sure there are many um, i can't remember exactly what but yeah there have been quite a few instances of um, me and my colleagues my friends telling you know just pointing out small small things that uh, this patient's euro bag is like uh, open or you know some small things the bandage is not correct some things which me we see which uh, some nurses may ignore or some doctors may ignore the srs may ignore so uh, it's definitely growing i think through modules like this uh, like i attended the the uh, the poki uh, session and the the training program i think the more and more awareness the more and more undergraduates which take part in these programs at the foundation level um, the more perspective we'll be able to inculcate in the ward settings in the uh, hospital setups and it'll definitely bring about a change in the longer run when we grow up to be uh, consultants and we grow up to be professionals so definitely i see a change um, over the past two years of course i don't have uh, that much experience but yeah definitely we medical students do uh, tend to provide a perspective um, to doctors and sometimes it's 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 very hidden we are not we are very scared or very hesitant to approach our seniors or our doctors to point out something uh again comes to psychological safety that are we equipped enough to even point out this maybe it's not our authority to come and uh point or point that out but in my example like i said that we have we ended up approaching the student nurse and we corrected it we thought that this needs to be informed about and we went about and unhesitantly we went and told that oh, this is wrong and this is definitely something which could be a hazard in the future so the more and more medical students uh so like like uh like the popular quote like Uh, what you know is what you see so if you are more aware about such conditions the safety hazards the more you will tend to see that in the hospital setup and the more um, we'll able to identify and change these things in the wards so that's what i hope is will improve in the future very well answered ashwin and i think uh, your confidence level speaks up for itself and i'm sure uh, dr sonika these are the students who are the next gen of quality improvement leaders from across the country and they're going to be hard wearing these patient safety and quality across this nation and uh, <clears throat> i would now uh, though very much i would like to continue but i would just have the last word from our representative from government of india ministry of health and we have uh, ms jina pradeep who's now moved into a new responsibility as uh, da dg nursing at ministry of health and family welfare i would like to call upon jina who's one of the founding members of nqcn as well and uh, jina would like to share the perspective and how now sitting in uh, the coveted chair of da dg nursing at ministry of health how you feel you can push this agenda i would use the word push only Uh, how would you you know further accelerate or catalyze the agenda of patient safety amongst the nursing colleagues and also the quality of care in your new position and through the machinery of the ministry of health and family welfare with your nqcn background 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for all the speakers of Be the Change Group for uh, doing this session, presenting this session very well. It was very informative, and I'm very happy that uh, youngsters are taking forward uh, this patient safety. So we will see uh, much improvement in the days to come. So I realize that as the number of patients are increasing, our challenges are also increasing day by day. But our infrastructure and facilities are not improved. As far as I concerned and from the hospital where I am coming, I have experienced that the infrastructural requirements and the HR requirements have not at all improved. Uh, and as a result, the nurse patient ratio is very inadequate and uh, where six patients has to be taken care of by one nurse in general wards, we are forced to take care of 20-25 nurses. Then one uh, day we try to uh, quantify the quantum of work a nurse has to do. Then we realized that almost 180 to 200 injections need to be administered by two nurses. So the workload is uh, so heavy and in on one bed, there are two to four patients. So there are times where we face difficulty in accessing the IV cannulas. So I would like to push this agenda that healthcare and this patient safety is prime focus of our government, then we need to go back and think about the nurse-patient ratio we are providing uh, to the system. So that um, in aligning with the safe system and adequate HR uh, availability, we can improve the patient safety. Otherwise, one way we will be focusing on patient safety only the and this patient safety if hr ratio is not improved then the patient safety agenda will remain in the documents only so um, we will be trying to improve or make the system foolproof uh, by having the innovations in uh, uh, equipment data management or uh, digital uh, drop down uh, drug prescription. Uh, so all these innovations will help us, but administering injections, we need nurses. So uh, nurses need to have uh, this nurse patient ratio. So I will fight for this. I will work for this from the GIS. So that is what uh, then optimal utilization also. Nurses are being made to uh, function as multiple other responsibilities intending these uh, these many drugs there are so many drug lists are increasing day by day you know after um, coming newer generations of drugs many other forms of drugs we have many things to intend workload is increasing in return also so uh, we will see we will do the needful as optimum utilization of this nursing hr for doing these independent nursing activities like medication administration so that we can provide the care in a more safe manner. So that is from my side. Thank you so much. Whenever we get a next opportunity, we will speak about it more. Thank, thank you, so, you much. so much, Gina, ma'am. And uh, thank you all the students, Kushbu, Nidhi, Ashwin and Vidanshi, you have been very kind and you have worked really hard to present all this. Uh, so thank you so much everyone for joining us today. Uh, we have posted the link of feedback and certificate of participation in the chat. If you want to receive the certificate of participation, please click on this link and fill a short uh, form. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much. <laughs>